this, and I don't have this up there, but these are uh, this is the different cases. These these three lead devices coming in, of course, the transistor is a three lead device. So uh, I'll put this up there. This is a good little reference sheet, you know, uh, especially when you're ordering to know which case you need to look for. So like if you go up to an electronic place, it might have a, a 2 and 3904, and then it's got about four or five different listings depending on the what, on the package that it comes in. And if you buy the wrong package, uh, then you got trouble. I wish we still had them. Somebody ordered a, bu some, a bunch of resistors. And they got them in service mount packs, <laughs> which don't do us any good. Uh, it was right here for a, a while. So we're talking about transistors. What is a transistor? Yeah, current valve, though. It's a current valve. That's exactly what it is. It's an electrically more electrically controlled valve, so we don't have to have electron. It is electronic the valve, but what's running at base, huh? Yeah, it's a current valve. That's what it does. It controls the current. It acts like so we can operate these things in what we call three different regions, right? And what are the three regions we can operate it in? Yeah, saturation, cutoff, and active. Are you okay? That sounds like a beautiful test question. Uh, when it's saturated, it acts like a closed switch. When it's cut off, it acts like a open switch. And when it's in the active region, it acts like a rheostat. That's exactly why. And, and if we ask you on a question, what does a rheostat do? And you would say it controls the current. It's a variable current controlling resistor. If you ask you what a potentiometer is used for, you say we use that to control a voltage. Y'all understand? So they have two different uses. But we can take one of the ends of the pod and connect it to the wiper, and it acts like a rheostat. So you're going to see a lot of pods used as rheostats because it can serve uh, uh, two different functions. Now what's the highest current in the transistor? Emitter. Second highest is the collector and the lowest is the base. So what we're doing is we're using a very small base current to control a very large collector and emitter current. Most people say collector current because we take for we we assume that the collector and the emitter current are equal because they're only so like 99.9% .9 of the emitter current is going to be collector current. Uh, beta, and there's your formulas right there for calculating the different currents. This will become important later on. Here's our three regions. And then we started talking about what is called the beta. But on data sheets, they call it HFFE, which stands for hybrid par parameters. And we'll understand those beta better when we get into the different ways we can connect the transistor. We can connect that transistor three different ways, and we'll talk about this. We don't need to know it now. We can hook it up common emitter, common collector, or common base. And that's what these HFFE stands for. HFFE is, if we, is, is connected with the emitter common. Uh, here's our formulas for beta. So what, what do you do with beta? No unit. It's a gain. It's just a multiplier or a divider. That's all it is. It's a number that I multiply with. If I know my base current, I can multiply it times the beta and get my collector current. If I, if I know my collector current, I can divide it by I can divide it by beta and get the base current. So that's all it is. It's just a, it's just a number, right? You understand that. And uh, DC alpha, this is IC over IE. We'll use this uh, when we get into a, what we call a common collector circuit. Now we identified the voltages right. So power supply for two digits, they're the same. So VCC would be what? It would be a collector power power source, right? VBB would be a what? 
base power source, and DEE would be an emitter power source. And we'll look at those later on and see why why we have those differences. If we give a, a B with a single letter, this is measuring to the lead of the transistor relative to the circuit common. So VC, I would measure from the collector lead to circuit common, right? VE, I would measure from the emitter lead to circuit common. And then DB would be from the base lead to circuit common. Everybody okay there? Then we have these other measurements we're going to talk about. These guys, did we get this far? Okay, so when we give two letters and they're different, this is measuring between those two leads. So BBE would be what? This, this means that I measure between the base and the emitter. Right? That makes sense? Okay. VCE, this is a very important one. This tells me if the transistor, it tells me what region it's operating in. If I measure the applied voltage across the collector to emitter, the transistor is cut off. If I measure less than one volt across collector to emitter, the transistor is saturated. If I measure somewhere between less than one volt and the applied voltage, it's operating in the active region. So this is the most one of the most important measurements we make right there, voltage collector to emitter. That voltage right there alone determines what region the the transistor is operating in. Y'all understand that? That makes sense. So this is our valve right here. Voltage the collector to the emitter is the valve. Well, we well yes, and we're we're measuring whether it's closed or open or is it sort of open, right? So we can open it all the way. It's kind of like a faucet. So you go to your faucet, is you can have it off, right? You understand. And then, but you can turn it on, but you don't turn it on a lot. And what are you doing? You're controlling the flow. And then, of course, you get up to a point, then you can't change the flow anymore. Well, that's when it's what? Saturated. And it usually happens before you get to the end of the, before you got actually get the valve turned all the way open. But remember, in, in electricity, when we talk about closed circuits and open circuits, uh, it's different than when we talk about water flow. Y'all know that, right? So if you take hydraulics and pneumatics, be ready. Yeah, it will, because it, there you're dealing with flow of, of a fluid. And, of course, if we say a fluid valve is open, we have water flow. If we say a full, full a fluid valve is closed, then we cut things off. But in electronics, if we have an open circuit, we have no current flow. And if we have a closed circuit, we do have clo we do have current flow. Voltage collector to base. These are important because these are going to be our, our, our we'll identify our breakover voltages. Are we okay? This makes sense. So everybody understand that. So this would be voltage collector to emitter. This would be voltage collector to base, and this would be voltage. Uh, by the way, the second one is considered to be common. So when I measure it with a meter, it says voltage collector to emitter, then I would put my common on the emitter, and I would put my red lead on the other one. That makes sense? So this even tells you how to make, it tells you how to make the measurement. So the one on the right is the common, the one on the left is where you're measuring to. So if I measured uh, between the base and the co and the collector, these this guy had better be more positive than that guy right there, because it's got to be reverse biased, right? And it's got to be below that collector to uh, it's got to be below that collector to base breakover voltage. If you break over any one of these two junctions, either this one right here or this one right here, uh, what's going to happen? If you break over a PN junction, reverse bias, what's going to happen? It's going to mess it up, right? Now, if you break this guy over, this is going to wipe it, really wipe it out, because so this, especially in the linear uh, or the active region. Um, so power supplies, external voltages, are, are designated with two letters. We're okay there, right? Uh, so... Uh, 
uh, what this power supply is called what? BBB, this power supply is called ECC, and we don't have emitter. Right now, we don't need an emitter power supply. Everybody okay? But if I was looking on a computer, and I was looking at the voltages on the, the microprocessor, you'd see VCCs and you'd see VEEs because they do power up the emitter on those things for our reasons we don't need to talk about here. So when do we know when it's saturated? We've got two ways on this we can tell when it's saturated. What's the two ways? So I, if I measure that and it's less than a volt, Right, sorry, wrong way. Then we know it's saturated. Or if I measure this and it's equal to VCC, that means it's saturated. Yes, less than one volt. It will never drop zero volt. Right? Everybody okay? You understand that? Because it's not a closed switch, it acts like a closed switch. This guy right here, if we got 20 volts and, and I had a real good measurement, it might be 19.999. But this guy here, but it, our meter is going to measure that as 19, right? I mean 20. But So we always have current flow through the thing, even when it's cut off. Because it is not an open switch. There is path we, we can get through there. So when I come up here and break a switch, I actually break the circuit, right? You understand? But when I come off and turn a transistor off, we still have a path that we can get jumped through, right? Uh, it's just like insulators. Insulator, conductor insulators have a current flow through them because they are, we have a path, right? So one, one end of the wire is, is connected to your positive potential. The other end of the wire is connected to the negative potential. Your insulator goes all the way up there, and so you have a path that current can get through. We call it volumetric current. Uh, but it's so low we can't watch, we can't measure, but there is current flow through an insulator. So there will always be some form of current flow through a semiconductor. So this is basically a the model that we have. And we're going to do a lot of, we have the base circuit, and we go through 1P in junction, right? And then what we're doing is this is a current amplifier. And what's this going to do? So this current flow through this junction is going to flow, is going to control that current over in the collector circuit. That makes sense? And when we figure this and we calculate it, we're going to calculate it like it's two different circuits. We're, we're going to have the collector circuit over on the output side, on the valve side, and we're going to have the base circuit over on the base side. And so later on, when we calculate these things, guess what law we're going to use? Ohm law. We might we'll use Kirchhoff's law a little bit, but the main main thing is when we calculate resistance, we'll use Ohm's law. So everything you need, just basic formulas, uh, we're going to add to it that we're going to, and most of it is just going to be applying the laws that we already know. So we already looked at this, right? So this is a two two power supply bias. This is the first one you're going to do, and we've already talked a bit about this, right? You can't use the trainer's power supplies for both of them. Y'all know why? Because they're connected like this. So we have a positive variable supply, and here's that little old positive terminal board, and then we have a common that is connected to ground. By the way, this is grounded. And then we got our our uh, negative power supply that looks like this. But notice on this one, the the negatives have to be common. But on the power supplies in the trainer, y'all understand. So you cannot use both power supplies in the trainer. Uh, you can use it for one of them. It don't make any difference which one you want to use it for, but you can't use it for both. So what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to get a second power supply, right? And so what you're going to have to do on that second power supply is you're going to have to take the black lead and hook it up to the ground lead on the trainer. And that way you establish 
the common for both power supplies, right? You establish this, and then you use whichever one you want to use. You can use the, the negative or the positive, depending on which one. I mean, uh, here we, we use both positives, I'm sorry. So you'll have to use the positive power supply. If we're doing a, a PMP transistor, we'd use negative power supply. Everybody okay? And this is showing you this. So if if I measured right here and got uh, 10 volts, and then I measured relative to common, and then I measured right there and got uh, 0.7 volts, then what would be the voltage of collector to base? Should be able to do that in your heads, guys. Now, this is the most often way we measure transistors because we're dealing with a little old, tiny thing sticking up there. We got three leads coming out, and those dang leads are so close together that if you try to put a meter on that and you slip just a little bit, you got to short, right? You understand? So, normally when we measure the transistor, we're going to measure out here on these resistors. And I and that's one thing, another thing that I have a little problem with trying to teach is people when when they say measure the base voltage, they think by God they got to get on the watt, they got to get on the base. You got this big old resistor right there connected up to it, and this right here is a straight piece of wire. And you got that big old metal lead on that resistor sticking up there, so that's where you're gonna make these measurements at, right? And normally what we do when we make measurements, we try to make it relative to circuit common. In fact, the best thing to do is to go ahead and clip this sucker on something that's a common and then just measure with one probe, right? And that way you're not trying to do what? Handle two probes at the same time. That's the way most short circuits occur. So what would be my voltage collector to base? So VC, VC equals to 10, VB, because we don't have anything else in there, it equals to 0.7, and these are volts. What would be voltage collector to base? 9.3. Y'all understand that? And that's what this next slide shows. So so if I, if I measure these relative to common, then uh, VC would be, uh, VC, we got several ways. This is one way we could do it. This is one we're going to use. Uh, so voltage collector to emitter would be VC minus what? VE. Voltage collector to base would be VC minus VB. Voltage base to emitter would be VB minus VE. And this is if you make your measurements relative to what? Common. Now we can calculate VC by taking the voltage drop across RC. Now what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna give these resistors names. We're gonna call that guy RC. So if I know the voltage drop across RC, then we can calculate the collector voltage by doing what? Yeah. So this is gonna be VCC minus what? That makes sense? Everybody okay? We're gonna use that one here pretty soon. Uh, silicon, we're going to assume about seven tenths. Germanium, we would do what? Three tenths. All the transistors that we're going to be wiring up in this class are silicon. Now, when we was looking at the transistors the other day, we had some germaniums in there, which is pretty interesting, right? Showed you how to test a transistor. Are you okay? This is what we call, a, and, and this is what you're going to do first. Uh, you're going to do this lab right here. Are you going to hook up a little NPN transistor, a 3904 transistor, which we looked at the data sheet the other night? And what you're going to do is you're going to generate what we call the characteristic curves. And we call it the collector characteristic curves. And your book does a really good job on this, on characteristic curves. So what we do is down here, this is going to be voltage collector to emitter. 
And then this right here is going to be your base current. Over here is bad, and so that's when you would actually break it over. So we're not going to break over the transistor. Everybody okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to uh, come up here. And uh, this over here, by the way, is uh, this is IC. This over here is what? VCC. And what are these going to be? Base currents. So what you're going to do is you're going to come up here and you're going to adjust this voltage to get a certain base current. And how are you going to do that? Where well, you're going to calculate what voltage drop will be across that resistor. That resistor is in series with the base current. So here's my base current right here. Right? So that means I don't have to use my ammeter. I can use that resistor. I don't forgot what size it is. But what I would do is I would calculate the voltage drop. So what would, how do we calculate voltage drop? So VRB would be equal to what? On the ball, guys. V is equal to? Time's off. So you're going to know the size of that resistor. You're the one that puts it in there, right? You understand. And it says, okay, I want to come up here, and I want 100 microamps worth of current. Well, what you do is you come up here and you calculate what our VRB would measure, right? You put your meter across VRB and you adjust that resistor right there until you get that voltage drop. As soon as you got that voltage drop, then you got IV. Then what you're going to do is you're going to go over and adjust those things across this range. And you're going to make several measurements. And then you're going to draw dots. And what you're doing is you're seeing how IB, IC responds. IC, a voltage collector to emitter should not respond because a collector current is supposed to be set by a base current. So even though I, I changed my applied voltage across my collector to emitter, the dang, the dang collector current should stay about the watt, about the same. Now it can't because it's got a slight slope up because of the resistance of the semiconductor, right? You understand. And then what I'll do is I'll do what next? I'll set my next base current. How do we set that base current? Yeah, we go back, recalculate what that resistor is going to drop. We set the base current, and then we go over and change the collector, the voltage collector, the uh, VCC. And then we'll do this several places. Now, what's so neat about a, a characteristic curve is that we can tell exactly when the transistor is cut off and when the transistor is saturated. So once we get that and this table is set up in the book, I, what I need to do is uh, the book actually does a better job with it than my slides. So this would be an example of a collector characteristic curve. And we had a piece of equipment. I wish I could find it. I've looked for it. It's called a curve tracer, which is really neat, where you can put a transistor inside the curve tracer and hook an oscilloscope of it, and it develops these curves for you up on the oscilloscope, which is really neat. I looked for a circuit, but they were a little more complex for me to build. Well, it's a piece of equipment, so well, I don't know what you mean. You, you can't make it part of the oscilloscope, but you can. And there was on there, by the way, where they made a, you might want to look at that one, where they made a curve uh, tracer with an Arduino processor. I just looked up, yeah. I just looked up the uh, trans, um, yeah, transistor curve tracer. I think I searched for that in schematic. A transistor curve cycle schematic, and one of them was, I just said, oh, Wesley, I like that. So this is what we would look like. This is, this is what we should come up. Now, we're not going to do very, very many 
graphs. So we might be two votes, and we might do ten votes, and we might do – we can't do 15. Our, our power supplies only go up to uh, about 15 votes. So I don't know exactly where we'll cut off uh, maybe ten votes. And then we'll come over here and go from two votes. Now, once you got this, you can literally tell where this thing is going to operate at. So that means I could come over here and I could draw a line. Uh, so I could come over here and I could draw a line from 5 milliamps. Then I could come over here and I could go up to 8 milliamps. And this would tell me the exact current I would need to get that voltage collector to emitter. So it says, okay, I need five milliamps of this, but I don't even need that. I just come up here and see what line that crosses on, and that would tell me the base current that would be required to get that voltage collector to emitter. Of course, what region are we operating in? If we have, if we operated at eight volts. Of course, I have to tell you what's applied. Uh, let's say we have a 14 volts applied to it. What region is that in? So what's this down here? Voltage collector to emitter, right? Is it dropping zero? No, it's dropping eight volts. Is it dropping is it dropping fourteen volts? No, we got it dropping eight volts. So what region is it operating in? What? Guys, this should be pretty easy. Come on, come on. If it was saturated, it would be less than a volt. Is it less than a volt? No, I've got it dropping 8 volts. If it was cut off, it would drop the applied voltage. I told you that the applied voltage was, what, 14 volts. What region are we operating in? Active. Now, when we, we, when we use this guy as an amplifier, we are going to operate it in the active region. If we use it as a switch, we're going to switch it between what? Cut off and saturation. Y'all understand that? We can't amplify in cutoff, and we can't amplify in saturation. But we can definitely amplify if we got it in the active region. Which means these are going to be. And this is our circuit. This is the one y'all going to do. Now, we're going to have to use a potentiometer because, uh, I don't know. We might not have, it depends on the voltage range I have to have you select. Y'all can look at the lab book. I don't forget which lab number it is. It's like 34 or something like that. Yeah, in the lab book. I don't remember which one it is. And this is what y'all going to do is y'all going to, y'all going to develop the characteristic curves. And then we'll play around with these and look at these. The characteristic curves are not given inside data sheets anymore. So that means if you want a if you want a characteristic curve, you have to do what you have to develop yourself. That would well for demonstration purposes. Most of the time, uh, we can get a good idea without a, without characteristic curves. But characteristic curves are really neat to show people how what's actually going on inside the transistor. So we can we can design amplifiers without characteristic curves just from what's in the data sheet, and that's why they became a lot less popular, except when we teach transistors. So this is basically what we're going to do. We're going to set up a base current, and then we're going to do what? Then we're going to adjust the collector voltage, right? And then we're going to record it a couple of times in the table, and then we're going to do what? Then we're going to connect the dots. That's what we're going to do. And uh, you can you can really tell how the thing's going to operate in a DC circuit, and you get a pretty good idea how it's going to operate in an AC circuit too, which is pretty neat. Uh, the first handout lab we're going to do is when we start playing around with what we call a saturated switch. So we'll look at the saturated switch, and then uh, are we going to operate it as a switch? And we'll show you how to design one of these. It's not very complicated. It's just Ohm's law. So when we saturate it, what do we want it to do? Well, first of all, we want to power this thing up with what's required by the load. 
if if this is a light bulb, we got any, we we have no problems. If it's a light emitting diode, and we're going to operate it on a power supply, uh, we know light emitting diodes. We we went to that and uh, we went to how to choose the resistor, right? How do you choose the resistor? So if I'm going to operate an LED, a light emitting diode, let's say I'm going to operate it on 15 volts. Okay, what am I going to have to do? If I put that LED across 15 volts and I forward bias it, it's going to, it's going to be gone just like that. So what do we need to do? We need a resistor. We can put it in the uh, in the anode, or we can put it in the cathode. It don't make any difference. Okay. How do we size the resistor? This is a common circuit, guys. Y'all might even. I mean, this would be a cute little circuit for. First of all, what we need to know about the diode, if we know what diode we got and we get a data sheet for it, we need to know the VF of the diode. If we don't know the VF, then odds are rule of thumb is to use two volts. Uh, the next thing we need to know is we need to know the IF of the, uh, of the diode, and they give you the maximum current. Usually it's around 20, 20 milliamps, uh, but we don't use the maximum current. We drop that down at least 10, 15 percent. So we usually use 15 milliamps. Okay, so I've got 15 volts up there using Kirchhoff's law. Uh, this guy right here is going to drop two volts. How many volts has le is left over for the resistor to drop? Well, that's that? 13 volts. Okay, so what current do we want? We want 15 milliamps. I want that resistor to drop 13 volts. What size resistor would I use? R is equal to what? V over I. So what would R be equal to for this situation right here? Yeah, we can round this. <laughs> we can drop digits around it. 866.1? Okay, so 867. Well, what's the problem? It's not a standard resistor. So what we got to do is figure out, okay, do I want to go down or do I want to go up? Now, remember, if you go down, you're going to move it toward its maximum current. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you go down, you're going to move it toward its maximum current. If you go up, you're going to move it away. If you and of course the the safety way would be was to move it up, right? You understand. But remember, if you move it up, it's not going to glow. It's, if you make the resistor bigger, it's not going to glow as bright. So we have to put that resistor in there. So if I was going to come up here and do this with a transistor, Uh, I didn't want to do that. That's not what I want. This is what I want. So we're going to let y'all figure out how to design a saturated switch. First of all, you got to know your load, right? You need to know the volts and the current required by the load. We're going to place the load in the collector circuit, in the collector lead. What happened to it? Undoubtedly, I didn't do much. So the first lab you'll do, uh, by the way, I'm working on a lab too that we might, a uh, handout lab on transducers. I've, uh, 
but we'll we'll see if we can get that one in. Uh, so I'm gonna use a PMP transistor. And right now we're gonna connect the emitter to common. And then I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna put my load. So let's say we're gonna turn in a, an LED. And we're gonna use a, let's use a 10 volt supply. A VCC. Okay, so what size resistor what I need? So we're going to come up and figure out how to saturate this transistor. And we'll hook up this circuit too to see. So what size resistor would I use? So y'all give it to me. Y'all got the standard resistor chart? Oh my goodness. Got it. Huh? What's that? I don't know. I mean, y'all getting it for me. Is it a standard resistor? Five hundred thirty three is five hundred a standard resistor? Yes or no? Huh? It's on blackboard, right? Under handouts. Huh? Take it there there's one on the back of the Zener lab too, the one y'all working on. Some of y'all are still working on Zener lab. I'm waiting. So what voltage do we want it to drop? Uh, we want to drop eight volts at 15 milliamps. Okay. Yes, no. Oops. I got 66 ohms. Eight volts divided by 0 0.015. 533 ohms, yeah. So what we need to do is figure out do we want to go up or go down? So basically what we'll do is we'll just choose the one that it's closest to. What's that? That's the one it's closest to? Huh? Yeah, but that's only 30, that's only um, 560 ohms. Yeah, that's only, what, 27 ohms. That'd be good. Now, why didn't we say the term? Why didn't we consider the transistor? Because we're going to saturate this thing, right? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to we're not going we're going to do this. Instead of using another power supply, I'm going to tap off this guy right here, and I'm going to put a resistor right there. And then what I'm going to do? I'm going to put a switch right there. So we're going to call this RB. So that means when I close the switch, the LED should come on. And when I open the switch, the LED should go off. 
So when I open the switch, we're basically taking away the base current, right? No base current means, yeah. And if I close it, we're going to get base current. So what I need to do is I need to figure out how to size RB. I know over here I have 15 milliamps, but I'm not going to use 15 milliamps in the base because 15 the base is not going to require 15 milliamps, right? You understand? And that's that's what we get out of a transistor. We get current gain. So what I need to do is figure out an IB that will always saturate this guy. Somebody give me some ideas. It's on your formula sheet. If you look at transistor switches. So we got this thing that says beta is equal to IC over IB. So if I know the beta of the transistor, that means I can calculate what IB would be required to get what? So what would IB be equal to? Well, IB would be equal to IC, which is 15 milli, divided by beta. We're using a, we're going to use a 2N3904. Why? Because that's the one we're going to use in the lab. And that's the data sheet we looked at the other night. So I'll go up there and tell me what beta we're going to use. You got to be on Blackboard. Y'all on Blackboard? Y'all ain't, ain't locked in the Blackboard yet, even though I gave y'all a hint a while ago? So what are we looking for in the spec sheets? We're looking for H sub FE, right? It's not going to be in the absolute maximum rating table. It's going to be down in the electrical characteristic. Now, what's the problem? Yeah, well, the problem, we it could be anywhere between 100 and what? 300? Could be anywhere from 300 to 30. Which one's guaranteed? 30. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to use the guaranteed beta to calculate that resistor. Because if I use the guaranteed beta and the beta is higher, the transistor is already saturated. Y'all understand? You can't saturate, you can't turn a switch on more than when it's turned on. So if I size that res resistor for guaranteed beta, then that means it's going to saturate no matter what the beta happens to be. Because beta can only do what? Go up. So I'm going to say IB sat. We call this IB sat, by the way, because this is the, what we're going, what's required to saturate it. This is going to be 15 milli divided by 30. So what would be my guaranteed saturation current? Five hundred microamp. Okay, so I'm going to choose the resistor. So I know R is equal to V over I. So RB would be equal to what voltage am I going to use? I'm going to use 9.3. Why? Because the di so here we got a series circuit right here. Kirchhoff's law says the sums of the voltages has to equal to the applied voltage. We're going to assume this guy here is dropping about 7 tenths, and it does. We did it right around 3 on, okay. So I'm going to be 9.3 divided by 500 micro. And we're going to round this guy down. Mom, we're going to round it down. Well, if we round it up, we're moving away from guaranteed saturation, even though odds are it'll work. Because odds are we're never going to be in a, a temperature where we're going to use a beta of 30. So there's probably a 95% chance that it's going to be greater than 30. So if you round up, that's okay. But normally what we do is we round this guy to here down. What do we come up here? What's that? 
17.6K. 19.6K. 18.6K. Okay, so let's go down to the next, let's go down to the next standard value. 16K. And you got yourself a saturated switch. It's taking 500 microamps on this side to get 15 milliamps on the other. Pretty neat, huh? And that's what we get out of these current. Now you can do it for any load you can you can anticipate. Uh, there is one thing we got to really really be careful with, and that's if we're going to use this thing to activate a solenoid, or we're going to use it to bring in a relay. So a relay is nothing but a bunch of coils wire, and AC it would act like an inductor. But what we're going to do, transistors deal with DC, right? Now, the problem we have is this with these guys. So when I produce a voltage magnetically, uh, what determines the amount of voltage that I get? So what do we need, first of all, to produce an EMF magnetically, using a magnetic field? What three things do we need? We need a magnetic field, right? We need a conductor, and we need motion. So the magnetic field has to move. I mean, either we move the magnetic field across the conductor or we move the magnetic field through the conductor. Uh, what determines the amount? Yeah, we'll, we'll go in order. The strength of the field, right? The number of conductor loops. And that's supposed to be conductor. And what's the last one? Speed of the motion. Now the problem we have is uh, I can come up here and I can, uh, let's say I come up here and make this 10 volts. Well, when I saturate that transistor, this guy here is going to charge up the 10 volts. The magnetic field builds out around all those coils of wire, right? You all understand that? Let's say I turn that transistor off. Well, all those magnetic lines of force that was outside all them turns of wire now comes collapsing down into them. So I've got a bunch of turns of wire. I have a magnetic collapsing magnetic field. And while it's collapsing, I have motion it will induce a voltage back into that coil that's opposite of the voltage that we applied. Because we got we got a north-south when we went this way, right? You understand? And when the magnetic field collapses back in, it's going to come in the other way. And these, these guys, these are DC relays or DC solenoids, and the only thing they get their resistance from is the, the length of the wire. So a DC solenoid or a DC relay is going to have a lot of turns of very fine gauge wire. And when that magnetic field comes collapsing back into those many terms of fine gauge wire, it's going to produce a voltage and it is going to blow that transistor up. You are going to exceed the breakover voltage collector to emitter. Now what I've got up here is, uh, let me bring up my camera. And what I'm going to do, and I've got an inductor here that I'm going to charge up to three volts. Here's my inductor right here. In fact, it's still up here. Uh, I've got my scope. I'll do this for you. We got our scope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the output of my power supply and I'm going to hook it up to my inductor. This is only three volts, guys. You see the kick coming off that inductor? That is 10 volts per division. Go reset. Sorry, guys. I'm looking at the wrong side. I'm starting my power supply. Okay. 
Charging it to how many votes? Three. This is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and I run out of scope. So that sucker, when that magnetic field came collapsing back into that coil, created over 60 volts. What would that do to my little transistor that's got a breakover voltage of 60 volts? It's going to fry it, right? You understand? So what we do, and this is, uh, the book shows y'all this. See, y'all look in y'all's uh, textbook. Let me bring up the other slides. We do this. This is called a flight. People call that a flyback uh, diode. Some people call it a a uh, counter EMF diode, which is what I call it. You hook it up opposite of the polarity of the of supply. So when I come up here and put power on this thing, here's plus right up here, and I'll take you over to the armatrol line and. Look at all the relays over there, and every one of the coils has got a watt across it, a diode. So here's plus right there. When I saturate it, and of course, this down here would be minus. Is the diode forward bias or reverse bias? Reverse bias, so there's no current flow through it. But when I turn that thing off, it generates a, that counter EMF does that. Now the diode is what? Forward bias. Now, there's no current because that the wire has a bunch of resistance, but those breakover voltages are not current ratings. Those breakover voltages are voltage ratings. If you exceed the breakover voltage on a, on a PN junction, it will be destroyed, right? You understand that. So if you left that little diode out, we had a, a, a big old, a big old uh, uh, a line printer. Y'all should have seen these things. These things were amazing. These things were rated in line per minute. We had a 500 line per minute printer, and the way it did, it had a band uh, had a band that spun around, and that thing would fly. And all the letters of the alphabet was on that band about four times. And at the instant, and it had a timing thing on it, and it had a hammer and had a had a uh, had a ribbon, and it had a solenoid that fired that that ribbon up against that band while it was moving and printed the letter. I mean, it'd be going, and the paper would be spitting out of that printer. It was print out so fast that we had to put a static discharge on the paper because it was moving so fast it would build up a static charge. And we don't see printers like that anymore. Right now we have these little old laser printers. We think them suckers are fast, but them big old line printers, them suckers, them would spit. They they get 134 cal 134 column character lines. And we did 600 lines a minute. And what happened is that one of these transistors that fired the solenoid that pushed the, pushed the ribbon into that band while it was spinning went out on us. And it burned a little hole in the circuit card. We got that thing out and we got epoxy. We epoxied it all up, put a new transistor in there, put that thing in back in there and turn that sucker on and it caught on fire. <laughs> Because what, what didn't we even think about? So we replaced this guy because it was definitely bad. It was charred. We didn't even think about replacing that, that little flyback diode over there, and it was shorted. So the first time that transistor fired, it was trying to drop the supply voltage for that printer. And you could imagine that thing, you know, how much power supply it was. And the epoxy caught on fire. You know? It was burning in the back of that printer. We was down on our hands and knees trying to blow it out because the board was in a cage. Uh, you could see it burning inside there. We did get it out. But it, it was funny at the time. It looked like the three stages back there trying to get that thing. Out. So if you got if you got a solenoid or this thing's pulling in a relay and the transistor goes out, you need to do what? Check that dang diode. And odds are you're going to have to pull one of the leads because these guys here have very low DC resistance. Now, a DC, a DC uh, solenoid would have more resistance than an AC solenoid. An AC solenoid has nothing at all. So let's uh, we'll we'll take a break. Let's go over and look at uh, some of the relays over there on the manufacturing line. And what are you going to see across the coils? You're going to see diodes. And we, we were taking. 
we were taking the school and uh, the guy was, uh, that's one of the problems they put into the lights, right? So about the only thing we're going to use the two the two power supply bias for is we're going to use it to to establish the characteristic curve for the transistor, just to give you all a little feel of that. Uh, then after that, we'll show you how we bias with single power supplies. So normally that's what we do. We don't put multiple power supplies in in a device unless it's audio. Audio usually runs a pos positive and minus supply. Uh, establish the voltage and current required by the load. We call this IC SAT. Choose a transistor that will supply the current when saturated and block the voltage needed by the device when the transistor is cut off. So what we're going to choose is make sure we choose a transistor that has a has breakover voltages that are greater than what we're trying to block, right? When it's turned off, and make sure that it can it can control the amount of current that I need to control when it's saturated. Uh, IB sat. Once we get that, uh, then we calculate IB sat. IB sat would be equal to IC sat divided by beta minimum, right? And then RB would be equal to the uh, BVB, which we use about seven tenths of a load, divided by IB sat, and we do what with this one? Round down. So it's not hard at all to develop saturated transistors. And these should be on your on your sheet, but these are just using basic laws. We use Kirchhoff's law, we use Ohm's law to calculate those resistors. And of course we added one little thing and that's what? Beta. We had to learn about beta. And to guarantee saturation we use what? If we use beta, if you use beta minimum, you guarantee saturation. Because if the transistor gets hot, beta goes up. Well the transistor is already saturated. And once it's saturated, you cannot saturate it anymore. Y'all understand that. So if beta goes up, we use 30 and it goes up to 100. We've calculated, we've calculated 500 microamps, right? You understand. Now, but you can't get more than what's required for that, for the load to drop all the voltage. So when the load drops all the voltage, IC cannot go up anymore because it has no voltage to work with. Y'all understand that. So if we use minimum beta, what do we guarantee? We've guaranteed saturation, whether it's in the middle of January or whether it's in here in August, you know, or whether I'm working out in a plant or an air conditioned plant, when I turn that PLC on by George, that sucker is going to saturate and it's going to give me the required voltage, right? So PLC outputs, by the way, are rated at a current which would be basically, it's rated at a voltage and a current. As long as you don't exceed that current, the transistor is going to saturate and going to provide the current for the load, right? If you exceed the current, then either you're going to burn off, your, burn out your output or the PLC is going to cut that output off. Are we okay? No big deal. So the first lab that we'll do, so what labs are we going to do? We're fixing to go to labs, guys. So what are we going to do? And then, then we're going to get into amplifiers. This guy right here. We're going to get into something called voltage divider bias. Uh, of course, I think we have a test coming up when? No, I think it's Thursday, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Coming up this Tuesday? Next Tuesday? Okay. I don't know. I, I'm giving. Next week, y'all are going to take care of me. Next week is end of T1. And uh, so I'm going to be giving a lot of tests. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. We 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 have we have test bank for this class. We have circuits for this class. We got everything prepared for this class. So all I got to do is just put it together. It don't take me no time to put these tests. Now the further we move, the harder it's going to be. That way, I'd be given on Thursday. I'd be given. Yeah, three class, three tests to three different classes. So yeah, we'll we'll leave it here. I'll put, I'll go ahead and make the review available uh, tomorrow. So uh, 
And then uh, this is what we'll go into next. Different ways we can bias the transistor. You can see how many power spots we're using. This one. And uh, we're not going to get into the design. We 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 design transistor switches because they're really, they're they're really very simple. Uh, designing a a transistor amplifier is not easy. It's one of those things you design it with math and then you adjust it so it works. Because um, are we okay? All right, guys. Let's go to lab. Which one's lab? I, I don't have my I don't have my lab book. Which one is it? The one that says transistor switch. Some of y'all are still working on your Zener lab. Most of y'all are pretty close to finishing that up. All you got to do is run it through its uh, check. And then after that, we'll do whatever lab it is that's uh, for these. Yeah. You know. Are we okay? Any questions? Yes? 